I don't want no oil A spoil in my shoreline I like fish much better than crud I like birds and things A creeping and crawling Won't trade no more oil for blood The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run but that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit. Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, Columbus, and hello to those of you listening on the internet wherever and whenever you are. My name is Joe DeMar, and you have had the good fortune to tune into For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a show where we talk about ecology and the environment. We talk about them in ways that they affect you, they affect your wealth, your health, your happiness, the happiness of those around you, your pets, your plants, uh, just pretty much just everything living on this planet, which as far as we know is the only planet where things are living. And it's uh, we got a good show lined up for you today, pretty interesting show. We have uh, a little bit of an introduction here, and then we're going to be talking about deception in nature. We're going to be talking about when, when nature gets sneaky. Uh, we'll hear from our advertisers, our wonderful advertisers. We have some eco news and views coming up and uh, our letter from the future. And of course, we'll be hearing from Rebecca Wood, my fantastic co-host, who will be joining us shortly here. And hopefully at some point during this hour, we'll hear from you at 866-240-1065. 866-240-1065. This is the best show in Ohio, but it does get better whenever you call. And this is a good time to call if you have any sort of questions about any environmental or ecological issue. We'd be happy to tackle them. And if I don't know about it or if Rebecca doesn't know about it, we will find out. This is, interestingly, this is our 99th episode of For a Green Future. So next week is episode 100. And we're going to do something special for that next week. I'm not exactly sure what, but we'll figure something out in the meantime. But uh, I am actually broadcasting uh, right this from Boston. <laughs> I happen to be in Boston. I'll probably be here for the next couple weeks. And it was very interesting since I was here in Boston on Thanksgiving Day itself. And I wasn't able to meet with my family. We did some things with Zoom meetings and so forth like so many people. But uh, it was, you know, my wife and I are here in Boston and so we decided to go to Plymouth for the uh, where they have the National Day of Mourning at Plymouth Rock, which is very which was very uh, interesting and, and informative, and it's an event that's hosted by Native Americans, quote unquote white people. Actually, aren't don't even speak at this. It's purely a, a Native event, but there but everyone is invited to it. And finally, you know, we we left. We talked about Thanksgiving last week with Philip Yenyo uh, from the American Indian Movement of Ohio. And uh, so when I went to this thing, and there'll be pictures of this on the YouTube version. If people are interested, they'll be able to see some of what I saw that day. But one thing that happened is they set, I got some things, we left things a little bit up in the air last week in terms of what actually did and didn't happen. And I just wanted to really quickly run through the, the facts of Thanksgiving. Okay, so 
there actually was a Thanksgiving feast on in the year 1621, and the the pilgrims, although interestingly they weren't called pilgrims until about 1880, they called themselves the separatists. The people we know as pilgrims supplied the the vegetables and uh, that they had grown themselves because they were celebrating a harvest, and the Wapanoag. Uh, warriors who were coming by it was just a, a band of of, of uh, warriors they supplied the venison they supplied at least eight deer and uh, possibly some more and there may or may not have been turkey that's a, a matter of debate but that was the first sort of thanksgiving but the first official you know government recognized thanksgiving was 1637 which was a, a celebration of the massacre of the Pequot Indian tribe, uh, wiping out a village of about 400 people in the most inhumane way imaginable. Uh, so that was the first official Thanksgiving. But what happened and what hasn't been mentioned much is uh, Abraham Lincoln's role in all this, because he, in 1863, is the one who declared... Uh, Thanksgiving a national holiday and it, it's interesting he actually did this during the Civil War and so but that's when it became a, a national holiday and interestingly enough he was also celebrating some military victories he was celebrating some victories of the North over the South and uh, so he declared a national day of Thanksgiving and it, it has stuck since then but it, Part of the reason there's so much uh, confusion around what happened. I mean, and you know, we're, we're taught one thing when we we're in school, and then we learn more things as we're adults. And, and as Philip Yenyo said, in, in this case, you really kind of have to go seeking the truth to figure out what happened to, Thanksg to Thanksgiving. One of the things that has happened with it is that there was some intentional glossing over. There was some, you know, people probably guided by the, the best possible motivations. They, they wanted to create this image of a, of a, a wonderful, celebratory, uh, mutually respectful history between natives and, and settlers. And, but, they, in order to do that, they had to gloss over a whole lot of history and a, a whole lot of dead people, actually. So, so there was some intentional deception there, and that got me to thinking about deception itself. You know, we we humans think that we kind of have a, a mark, a corner on the market when it comes to lying and cheating, uh, but that's not at all true. Deception is there in nature all the time. It's an extremely important factor in ecology, actually. Things deceiving other animals, deceiving other animals. And uh, I just thought I'd, I'd talk a little bit about it because it's a fascinating subject and it's actually becoming, in ecology, it's sort of becoming its own branch of ecolo ecological studies. People are starting to specialize in just looking at ways things deceive each other. And uh, let's see, so I, I thought uh, one thing, that, one kind of funky thing about uh, an example of deception in nature is with garter snakes. Um, so garter snakes, when they mate, they form this uh, ball of, of, of snakes. And uh, in the center of the, this, this big writhing ball of snakes, which could have upwards of 100 snakes in it, uh, there's one female, one big old female, and a whole bunch of much smaller males. Well, some of the males have developed this ability to exude the the pheromones that uh, the female snake exudes. <laughs> and so what happens in this big mess of, of snakes writhing around is that some of the males end up mating with these males that are giving off the female chemicals. They think they're mating with a female, but they're actually mating with a male, which uh, means that they sort of uh, lose out on the whole mating thing, because then 
those deceptive males can go on and mate with the female and actually have offspring. So that that's a kind of a bizarre one. And a lot of this deception in nature seems to revolve around sex. It's kind of an odd thing. Uh, <laughs> of course, humans kind of do that, have a lot of that too to some degree. But um, blister beetle larvae are the ones that have probably taken this to the to the extreme. This this is the probably the weirdest example of deception I've ever heard of. But uh, what happens is uh, blister beetle larvae, and the blister beetle is a very interesting little beetle. There's a, they're very common. Uh, they've got stripes, and if you they're called blister beetles because if you crush them, they exude uh, toxic chemicals that actually can raise blisters on your hands. But uh, when they're larvae, just after they hatch, uh, they're they're little worm-like critters, and what they do is they hatch and then they crawl up to the top of the plant that they're that they are hatched on, and they clump together, and they have different colors on them, different stripes and, and uh, shadings, and the the larvae all pile up on each other to make what looks like a female a solitary bee. You know, not not all bees are social critters. A lot of bees uh, just go it alone, and so this. So these uh, these larvae form a solid. They they group themselves to look like a female solitary bee, and then they also give off the the pheromones of a female uh, bee. And so what happens is a male wanders along, poor hapless male wanders along, and and a lot of this deception seems to be because males are extremely gullible when it comes to reproduction. But the the male spots this fake bee and comes down and and tries to mate with it and when it does that some of the lar the larvae jump on its back and then after discovering he's been he's been hoodwinked the male bee goes off and tries to find a real female and if he does and mates with that one the larvae will jump from him to the female and then the female carries them back to her nest and then they'll jump off there and that's when they'll feed on uh, everything in the in the female's nest, <laughs> and so that to me, I just that one kind of blew my mind that this whole idea of deception has been carried so far. But like I say, it's very common in the in the uh, in the animal kingdom and in, in nature. In fact, boa spiders also uh, produce pheromones that mimic female moths and so when the male moths start coming close it's like what is where i smell a female around here they actually throw a web at them they make a little bola out of a web and throw it at them and and you know eat them but it's not just you know insects and snakes of course we uh some of our nearest relatives on the in the natural world uh like the monkeys and the apes they also can have uh, do a lot of deception and you know we all know about monkeys stealing I mean they're, they're monkeys are kind of famous for that <laughs> and there were some researchers in fact that were trying to take they were trying to examine monkeys and see if they could get them to do math see if they could teach them uh, one plus one equals two and they were using lemons which the monkeys loved to, as sort of a reward, but they found that the monkeys kept stealing the lemons. They would distract the the researchers, and when the researchers weren't looking, the monkeys would sneak around and, and just steal the lemons. They'd go to give them a reward. The the monkeys would have already eaten the the lemons, and so they decided to test this. So what they did is they took a bunch of lemons and they had two boxes, and one box had bells on it so that if you opened it, it would ring. And the other box didn't, and they put an equal number of lemons in both boxes, and then they sort of turned their backs and acted distracted, and immediately the monkeys ran to the one that didn't have bells, opened it up, and took all the lemons. So in other words, monkeys were smart enough to know that if they tried to open the one with bells, the humans would hear it and react, and so they were sneaky enough, they were deceptive enough to go for the box that didn't have the bells on it. And uh, <laughs> there's another uh, 
famous example, David Attenborough. We've talked about him before. He's a great naturalist. And if you haven't seen his film, A Life on This Planet, yet, you should definitely watch it. Um, and there's a book by the same name. You should definitely buy that. But he, on one of his trips, was filming capuchin monkeys. And capuchin monkeys in the wild have a very rigid hierarchy. You know, you've got the big, strong monkeys at the top, and they just constantly bully and harass the the weaker, smaller monkeys towards the bottom. And so it makes it very difficult for these lower lower monkeys to get food because they're always being picked on. And literally, if they find something and start eating it, monkeys will the higher monkeys will grab it from them and and eat it and be like, "What are you going to do about that?" So. He got on tape, he got on film a little capuchin, low in the hierarchy, lower in the pecking order, and he found a, a bird's egg, which is like gold if you're a capuchin monkey, you know, tons of protein, they're, they're delicious. So what happened is that the little monkey hid his egg in the water. They were next to a stream. He hid his egg in the water, and then he let out the snake call. And capuchins, like a lot of monkeys, have different calls for different uh, dangers. And what happens if, if somebody in the troop yells snake, all the rest of the monkeys go running up into the trees and everybody, they all start looking around for the snake and you know it, the whole troop runs off for a little while. So what this monkey did is it yelled snake, everybody else ran off, he was then left alone to grab his his egg out of the water and run off and hide and, and eat it un, unmolested and uh, so so they so even capuchins are, are able to to uh, to lie to the whole group and of course uh, it's little known fact that uh, that then David Attenborough used that film because if if the other monkeys found out if the other monkeys catch a lying monkey, that monkey's in real trouble. Everybody just sort of beats him up. So Attenborough used that film to blackmail that poor capuchin into performing tricks at his next party that he had for his uh, camera crew. That's Not many people know that one. Of course, this uh, act of lying to the whole group for your own personal profit, uh, humans have kind of perfected that, especially certain human politicians. Uh, have uh, managed to turn that into an art form. You know, it's a little, little more complicated than just yelling snake when there's no snake around, but the principles are still the same. And, of course, the the one big deception that uh, most every, a lot of critters do, a lot of things in nature do, is bluffing. And that is, you know, when you know you don't have uh, the ability or you pretend that you, you're going to fight or you're going to uh, attack somebody else. Most aggressive motions, most aggressive acts in nature are actually bluffs. Uh, most of the time, uh, if somebody, if a creature is threatening another creature, they're really hoping, fingers are crossed, that they don't have to go through with it because actual fighting, actual attacking is very dangerous. You can get injured you could get killed, and so it's much, much better to be able to just bluff your way through things. Um, and of course, we humans again, we have, we also do quite a bit of that bluffing. For example, if uh, we may have an example of that right now, where you know the the president knows that he's lost the election, but he is bluffing and and claiming that he didn't and that he's going to win all these court cases. The problem, of course, is that most of us know he's bluffing. I mean, the, the evidence is pretty clear that he's bluffing, and, and so bluffs aren't very effective if everybody knows that's what you're doing. Um, what do you think? If you, do you have any examples of deception? I mean, have you ever been tricked by a pet, for example? Um, <laughs> That's uh, that's something that some of you might have might have experienced a little bit of deception there from your your beloved pets. I, I had an example of that with uh, our beagle. We had a, a beagle for a long time named Beagle Boy, and uh, he 
had this he knew that we didn't like him to eat uh things that he was would catch out in the yard you know because whatever he would try to catch something like a rabbit or something like that if he managed to catch it we'd take it away from him and so he you know over the years he would try to catch things we'd take it away so at this one time he we noticed that he was seemed a little eager to go out you know he was a good dog he'd always ask to go out in the yard when he needed to so uh, this one time he seemed unusually enthusiastic about it and then so there was like this period of a week where like every morning first thing he'd be like okay let me go out i want to go out and so we let him out and about an hour or so later he'd saunter back in and then one of those times he like went out and then he he kind of gave me the impression he wanted me to look at him you know sometimes animals can do that you know with body language or whatever but uh what he did was he he went over to this one spot in his, in the yard and actually took a look was doing something over there and uh couldn't tell exactly what and then he he sat up turned around and looked at me and he had just the tip of a baby rabbit's foot <laughs> sticking out of his mouth and as i looked at him he just swallowed it down and it was like <laughs> so we figured out that what had been happening is that whole week he had gone out and one day at a time eaten like one baby rabbit and then on the last then he let me see that that he'd done it on the last day with the last rabbit just to just to sort of rub it in my face but he was he, that was an unusually smart dog so uh, rebecca are are you with us i am yes hooray so how are you doing? Oh, not bad. How about you? Oh, pretty good. Pretty good. Did you have a, a socially distant Thanksgiving? I did. Yeah, we we sort of uh, got some bad news that we didn't all didn't go see family, so that meant I had to do some cooking. Which you know, the, the, the cooking I'm not so nuts about. The eating I like. But yeah, we got some bad news. Uh, uh, apparently, my 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 dad and stepmom may have been exposed to COVID, and and her disability aids have it. Oh wow, that's terrible. So yeah, this thing has gotten around to me now. <laughs> hmm. Well, I hope they hope they do all right. Um, what? Yeah, well, it's worrisome because uh, you know if if dad dad has a congestive heart failure failure if if he uh, if he if he if he's picking up her her up alone because the aides are out of the picture and he, you know he he could drop the drop her and hurt both of them on the bathroom floor conceivably. Oh wow! Well, I hope they get through it. But what one bright note though is is we drove here, you know, from Toledo to Boston, and there was not a lot of traffic. And in fact, on the day before Thanksgiving. They had a, a new story here at Boston because apparently, traditionally, the roads out of Boston the day before Thanksgiving are are jammed bumper to bumper, and they they just every year do a story on how people can't get out of the city because the traffic's so bad. But this year, they apparently there were hardly any people going out. I mean, the the traffic was was incredibly light, and so I think a lot of people are actually doing what you did, and that is not going to see their their parents and not not traveling and actually following the scientific advice which is which i find that's funny because on the news they were talking about how oh airline reservations are up it's going to be bad so maybe it's not going to be bad as we thought fingers crossed <laughs> yeah if if the roads are any indication a lot of people stayed home and it didn't uh, and didn't risk it and didn't risk their families so, well, I'm sorry okay. to hear that they're that they're that they might be getting sick. Um, I hope they don't come down with it. But uh, yeah, so but, far uh, Renee has tested that's... positive. So, or he, she's tested negative. So, so far, so good. Okay. All right. Well, knocking on wood there that that they don't test positive. But... Oh, so I have a little stinker dog that I need to tell on. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, right. he has this. Is this the thing with deception that he regularly does where if, if I pull him away from something, 
like, you know, something gross that he wants to eat or a direction I don't want to go in. He'll do this thing where he pretends to comply with what I'm, with my orders. And then you, you will get about 10 feet away and he'll start to be like, oh, I want to sniff something. Oh, isn't this, oh, the trail is leading this way back to a couple inches back to where we came. Oh, a couple inches more, a couple inches more. Okay, we're right at the thing you said I couldn't have. <laughs> Maybe you forgot about that now. How did that happen? <laughs> yeah. Or, or, oh my God, when I, um, when he had had his his abdominal surgery for the blockage, he was not allowed to jump jump up on the on furniture, and he totally weaponized that because he knew that if he looked like I was about to he was about to jump up on furniture, I would sit up and reach out my arms to him, and then he would just sort of redirect my attention to what he the thing he actually wanted. He'd be like, "Okay, now you're up. Why don't you let me go get me a snack? Okay, now you're up. Why don't you you know do." Go do this thing. Oh, why don't you go put me up on on mommy's lap? Although she said no, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was such an easy, and and he would actually like after a while when I stopped falling for it, he he would actually come up, you know, do the oh I'm twitching my butt, I'm gonna jump thing, and and then when I looked skeptical, he would cut his eyes towards the towards the love seat, like oh no, this time I really need it. I want to jump up and cuddle with you. <laughs> I, he's yeah, part that's... wolf, you can tell. You know, that's, he, he has like a sneaky hunting skills, like, oh, the deer saw me, so I'll circle around and pretend I'm leaving and then come back, you know? Right, right. All right, yeah, they, yeah, animals can be tricky. I mean, it's it's not, we don't have, humans do not have a monopoly on, on deception, that's for sure. And if anybody really out not. there has a, a, a story of uh, animal deception, give us a call at 866 866- Two four zero one zero six five eight six six two four zero one zero six five, and uh, right now though I am not being deceptive when I tell you that we appreciate our sponsors and uh, this show is brought to you by the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They restore wildlife habitats, and they lead outdoor adventures. Wood County Parks protects natural spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. There are several ways you can get in touch with them. One is to call them at 419-353-1897. That's 419-353-1897. You can also go to their website, which is simply wcparks.org. And uh, you can go to download their app. They have a nifty app. You go to the app store and search for WC Parks. And, of course, they're also on Facebook and other social media. So that though, that's our sponsor. And then uh, we also have patrons. And patrons are people who've gone to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And they searched for For a Green Future, and they saw our our wonderful display there, our page on Patreon, and they chose a monthly amount and that it comes painlessly out of their checking account and joyfully into ours and helps us bring this show to you every week. And we're extremely grateful to our patrons. So that uh, so that's patreon.com. Did you have a little something for us here, Rebecca, this week? Oh, yeah, I did. Well, first of all, I've been watching public radio, and they, they said some stuff about the pilgrims, which we were sort of unclear on before um, we were talking about them. But, yeah, um, apparently the reason the, there weren't the, the Wapanoags were sort of decimated before the pilgrims came along was because they had caught uh, smallpox or some disease anyway from, uh, like, English explorers and fishermen who were wandering around the coast. And sort of that, plus the fact that um, some of the first some of the first Native Americans they met spoke English because they'd been trafficking victims. <laughs> sort of, it became sort of incorporated in the legend of the pilgrim. Oh, it was God's will. See, God prepared a way. Blah blah blah. It was God's will that we win and they lose. Yeah, the winners always think that. But yeah, mm. um, yeah, the, the yeah, I guess uh, Squanto had been. Uh, a slave in Spain, actually. They they caught him and they turned him into a slave and he managed to work his way back. Uh, but then, as you say, he got to the 
he got to where his village was and literally everyone else had died. So he was living alone in that village for about two years before the, the pilgrims showed up. Also, apparently, Pot, I think it was Pawtuxet, like the, the place that became the first, that became the first, uh, pilgrim colony had been the first, uh, the scene of one of the worst villages is completely decimated by the, uh, by the, by the smallpox to the point where, like, the, there weren't enough living to bury the dead. And, uh, it was also kind of a bad luck place for the pilgrims, at least the first winter, because apparently, they panicked so badly with, you know, the natives in the woods that were unknown and everybody uh, dead or dying of starvation and disease that uh, there's this myth, apparently, that, like, they asked them about it, well, uh, where are all the graves? And they said, oh, we did night burials. We went out night buried so the natives wouldn't see how many we were losing. But, in fact, what they did was uh, they admitted at, uh, at one point to somebody that, when people were were very sick and dying, the healthy people would drag them out into the forest and prop them up against trees with a rifle to make it look like they had guards. Uh huh. So that must have been sort of horrible. <laughs> and yeah. uh yeah, you touched on the massacre they were celebrating on the Thursday Thanksgiving was I think some other rival tried to the Wampanoags, which that they were allied against. Because the Wampanoags and the Pilgrims at this point were both in a pretty bad way. And the reason they made alliances with each other is because it was kind of their only hope of survival, you know. Otherwise, they were both weak, you know. They both were decimated by disease and things and, you know, that. So it seemed like a good idea at the time, especially when it seemed like it was just going to be that little batch of Pilgrims instead of thousands and thousands more when, uh, when, the company that had sponsored them back home discovered there was beaver in the new year in the in the new world. But yeah, so they had the the they had that they had the the, the the which I always wondered. It's like okay, if it was celebrating a massacre, why did the Wampanoags agree to come? Well, because it was another tribe, <laughs> and they didn't right. see that at the time that they really need to be allied with that tribe against the Pilgrims. But yeah, yeah, it was, so, the, it was the Pequots. The Pequot, yeah, that makes sense. But the ones yeah, that got so yeah. apparently, how the Thirty Years' War came about was Massasoit dies, his older son takes over, and then uh, a few years later, he dies, and, and Metacomet, King Philip, takes over, who has been his youngest son. And at this point, the colonists had expanded a lot, <clears throat> and they'd been decimated by disease. They decimated the Indians again by disease. So you know. The Indians got a little upset. They started doing little raids on, on outlying settlements. That's kind of, you know, I get the impression they expected the white people to fight like Indians, where you just sort of raid back and forth, you know, you take each other's stuff, maybe a couple people get killed. But no, you know, the, 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 the English felt like they had to respond with massive, overwhelming force, because how dare you savages kill any of us, you know? <laughs> Which, that's the thing, we don't get sort of just, you know, people think the golden rule is, I rip your liver out for a, for a paper cut, instead of just, I do to you what you did to me, exactly, or the equivalent, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, after after the raid started, the there was a new uh, treaty that was forced by the colonists, where the natives had to give up their guns. And then three Wampanoags were tried and, and hanged for uh, executing another Wampanoag, which was bad that that got tensions going and in six by 1675 to 1678 just full-on full-on war massacre raiding massacres back and forth for three years at least um including this is interesting uh john sassamon who was one of the first graduates he was a praying indian a, a convert and one of the first um one of the first graduates of Harvard <laughs> apparently told them at one point that somebody was plotting something against the English settlements, and uh, and later he turned up dead in a pond, and some more people got some more Wampanoags got executed for his murder. <laughs> so poor guy, that didn't used to happen to him. that doesn't happen to Harvard grads as much anymore. But it was basically let's see the Pilgrims plus the Mohegans and the Pequot versus Wampanoag Nipmuc. Kodunk, Narragansett, Nashaway, and Wabanaki. So, kind of the Pilgrims and a couple of allies against everybody. And, 
let's see, the whole thing, uh, the, the, the greatest battle was something called the Great Swamp Fight against the Neric Onset, the big fort that they had. Uh, in 1676, Metacomet died, and there was a total of 3,000 native casualties, apparently deaths and injuries, and uh, 2,500 pilgrim and allies killed or, or wounded. And um, apparently it was kind of an important war because it was the first war that Europeans fought in America, and it helped sort of have them, it helped them think of themselves as Americans distinct from English people because nobody in England helped them with anything at that point. <laughs> they were on their own. Hmm. Yeah, well, I guess, one, of the, one of the disturbing things I learned by going to the uh, Day of War Mourning there in Plymouth is that after uh, Medicom or King Philip got uh, assassinated, they said he was assassinated, uh, his skull was on display in the Plymouth Town Square. And, you know, we had marched to that town square, and they said for... For 25 years, they had his skull on a pole in the middle of the square, in the middle of town. And so it yeah, kind of makes too. you wonder <laughs> about, about the whole, uh, you know, which, <laughs> who were the savages here, you know, and who was the civilized one? I don't know. But, well, yeah. but apparently a lot so, of uh, early pilgrims had been through something called, were veterans of something called the 30 Years War in Europe, which, so they were just mean and nasty PTSD disorder guys whose violence was sort of the go-to solution for everything at that point. <laughs> yeah. Well, luckily, oh. <laughs> luckily it's a little better now. I mean, we're, we're not, we don't have people's skulls on display in town squares. Things have yeah, improved. That's gross. But we are still yeah. fighting a lot of battles. Yeah. And uh, Another I think reason... it's time to move on to the, oh, yeah. to our eco news segment. <laughs> eco news. All right, but you know it does kind of make you think. Maybe in the future, people are going to look back at the stuff we're doing ecologically with the same kind of revulsion that we look back at what things were doing to each other physically back in the 1600s. Hopefully, uh, anyway. So one of those things that's going on right now is uh, there's a New York Times article on, on November 27th, and the title was EPA's final deregulatory rush runs into open staff resistance. <laughs> so apparently the the poor beleaguered scientists and, and uh, staffers at the Environmental Protection Agency after four years of, of watching their, uh, essentially watching recommendations based on actual science simply get tossed out the window by the political appointees at the top of the agency, now that they know Biden has been elected, they're actually uh, actively trying to, to block the, the last attempts of the Trump administration to uh, eliminate science. And specifically, they're, they're, they're uh, trying to prevent something that is, it, on the surface, it sounds like this is a reasonable thing. Uh, in other words, this is deception. <laughs> All right. right. The, the, the reasonable thing is that it says that the EPA can't take any science into account which doesn't include 100% of the raw data that the study is based on. And on the surface, that sounds well like that. That makes sense. Except that what that means is if there's studies of people, like, you know, there's there's a, a longitudinal study that shows who gets cancer, who doesn't when they're exposed to this this or that chemical. The raw data includes the personal information of all those human subjects. And, uh. <laughs> and that, okay. that in science is a huge no-no. You can't violate people's privacy, rights to privacy. And for one thing, it, it opens them up to all kinds of uh, pressures, you know, like if you're working in the chemical industry and you tell a researcher, yeah, I got exposed to toluene all this time, and yeah, I developed this cancer, and if you're still, like, working <laughs> and that comes gets published in a study, you know, Bill Smithers <laughs> on this date said this happened, you're, you're going to get fired. <laughs> you're going to lose your, 
your job, which you're still dependent on for your health insurance. And, and you know, there's all kinds of ethical reasons that you don't list the names and, and addresses of all the people that you're studying or who participated in your studies. And But that's I'm what the Trump that administration wants. In other words, nobody is going to want to be in your studies in yeah, the future. If, what? Nobody's going to want to be in your studies in the future if you do that, for starters. Yeah. Yeah, A, nobody's going to want to be in your studies, and B, they know that according to institutional rules and scientific ethics, almost no scientific studies can meet that uh, that goal because they won't. Yeah. They simply can't uh, and won't do that, and so that means that now you don't have any scientific studies to base any of your regulations on. And the and the corporations get to do whatever they want because they say, oh, there's no evidence that right, doing no putting evidence, this yeah. or that chemical into the environment hurts anybody, because scientifically it can't be reported. So it's an extremely nasty deception that uh, the Trump administration is trying to pull off here. But hopefully, but thankfully, the heroes <laughs> at EPA are actually fighting back finally. And say you're you're not going to get this in in the last couple months of your administration. You're not going to essentially eliminate the use of science to determine regulations on things like uh, toxic chemicals. And let's let's hope let's pray that they win that that battle. Um, and they're also uh, starting to openly rebel because there have been uh, directives from the top at the EPA that. The EPA isn't being allowed to publicize the results of certain studies, the results of studies that show things that would be embarrassing to the to the uh, corporations that Trump represents, the ones that put him into office. And and one of those things, one of those new things that under the rules that were established by the by the politically political appointees at the EPA, they weren't allowed to publish this, but They've leaked it to the press anyway, and that is that uh, they did a study into diesel trucks, and it turns out about half a million of them, the people who own them, and you know who you are, and there are probably some listening to the show. Since, uh, you know this is normally a sports show, and if they bet it, if you manage to stick through to the show at this point, I have to congratulate you. But about half a million people have removed the pollution control devices from their diesel trucks. And this has just resulted in a massive wave of diesel pollution. And, oh, dear. And I know this personally because I, I live on Main Street in Bowling Green, and trucks of this nature are constantly going past my house. You know, big old pickup trucks that just are just belching black smoke and making this terrible racket because it also, you know, makes them noisier, dirtier and noisier. And I have to say to these to these guys, these quote unquote macho guys up there in your the big trucks where you've taken off the pollution controls, what you're doing in your big trucks by putting all this soot in the air is you are you are killing people. You're killing people that are that are sensitive to asthma especially young children. They're the most sensitive to pollution. And so, you know, as you're driving along, belching your huge clouds of smoke, you're killing little kids just as surely as if you were running them over. And so, uh-huh. you know, put your put your pollution control back on. It doesn't mean you're, take it off doesn't mean you're macho. It just means that you're willing to hurt other people to look cool and, Trust me, you don't. <laughs> Trust me, no matter how big your 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 billowing smoke clouds are, the rest of us aren't thinking, "Wow, he's cool." No, we're thinking, "Wow, what a that's you know that's a jerk." <laughs> there goes a jerk in that car. So, so uh, all right. So there's a there's some news. <sighs> now let's see uh, some happier news, some happier ecological news. Tasmania, the the uh, island that is also a state of Australia, Tasmania has reached 100% renewable energy, 
100 percent wind and hydro yes no oh, more right. gas no more coal uh while the rest of us while the united states is dithering around and and you know dabbling with the nuclear power again after we get got our fingers burned a number of times going back and trying to consider burning them again on nukes and things tasmania just went ahead and did it so uh, congratulations to tasmania they join another uh state in australia the australian australia capital territories they're all called the act they'd already achieved 100 percent renewables and they joined the country scotland iceland and costa rica so one by one it's happening you know new zealand has pledged to do it and the european a lot of the european countries are heading for it germany as we know has pledged to do it and their and their work going towards it as fast as they can so it is happening and tasmania is ahead of us <laughs> it's a little embarrassing to be you know to know that america with all our resources and all our technical capabilities we just got our butts kicked by tasmania so uh but at least they're doing well, doctors it. without borders is coming to help us with our with our medical system so you know <laughs> we may not be a first world country anymore <laughs> Yeah, I, I I can't wait till we're great again. That's that's what I'm. Yeah, looking, forward. be looking yeah. forward to that. Yep. All right, one more uh, bit of ecological news. Uh, Scientific American, uh, the December 2020 issue, has a report on something called Chernobyl exclusion zone radiation doses reanalyzed. So, uh, what happened it, with Chernobyl? is they did a study that showed that in the areas that had higher radiation there were fewer animals uh, which makes a lot of sense you know more radiation harder it is for complex critters to to survive genetically speaking because their their genes are under constant assault from the radiation and so it was pretty much a straight line dose that the higher the radiation level the fewer the animals and right on down you know, as long as there was any increase in detectable radiation levels, there was a decrease in the number of critters that were able to survive there. So that was the that was a first study that was done. And but then, a bunch of pro radiation scientists said that can't be right. <laughs> and so they went in, and they 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 did another study, which fuzzed out the the radiation levels by averaging them over a large area and guess what that study found there was no correlation between the the areas where there were no there were very few animals and high radiation Alrighty. and so what happened with this study is a bunch of other scientists went back in and they did extremely careful calculations of the animals and the doses they were getting they they not only looked at the amount of radiation in an area but they looked at like the animals and calculated exactly how much radiation they'd be getting based on their behaviors things like do they burrow into the ground or do they eat acorns and if they eat acorns how much gets of what kind of radiation gets concentrated in the acorn and so what's the dose of a let's say a squirrel eating acorns in this area versus a squirrel eating acorns in that area they went into incredible depth and detail and applied every single thing we know about radiation. And guess what? It's uh, a straight line relationship. Uh, radiation. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, the more radiation they got, surprise. the fewer animals there were, and the less radiation they got, the more animals there were. And so, <laughs> so this one looks unassailable. This one looks like the, the pro-radiation scientists quote unquote scientists aren't going to be able to to dispute this one or dis or quote unquote disprove it um, so and it and the fundamental thing is that this just makes basic sense I mean radiation damages animals damages critters and damages cells and it makes it harder to reproduce and so of course there'll be fewer animals there but um, again this deception the people that are pushing the nuclear industry have to maintain the fiction that radiation is doesn't harm 
people or doesn't harm organisms or, or can't hurt. In fact, some of them have gone so far as to propose, and the Trump administration tried to put this into law, into regulation, that some degree of radiation is actually good for you, which mm -hmm. uh, this this study published in Scientific American and this month in December's issue disproves that once and for all. So, so it's there. The case of figures don't lie, but liars can figure. <clears throat> yeah, right. And this All is right. the thing about deception. It, it's good in the short term, but for the community as a whole or the, the social group that you are in, it has a price, which means loss of trust, which yeah. means people aren't yeah. able to work together anymore and cooperate to survive and thrive. True, yeah. And the, the whole group wastes a lot of energy reacting to the falsehood. You know, they... they yeah. They, like if that capuchin, if that capuchin does that every day, you know, snake, 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 the whole troop eventually is going to get, uh, have trouble getting food and things because they're always running up into the trees because of these imaginary snakes that the. And that or the, uh, snake bite deaths go up among the troop of capuchins because they're now ignoring calls of snake. <laughs> yeah, right. That's it. The, the, the capuchin who, car, who cried snake eventually. People stop, uh, <laughs> stop reacting, right? So, uh, so I don't know. So this this show, you know, of course, for a green future, we're, we're one of the things we're dedicated to is finding the truth, and uh, it's kind of a full time job. I Maybe mean, we could be, <laughs> we could do this show three hours a day every day, and we'd still have a lot of untruth to, to unravel, left to unravel. But uh, one Indeed, thing that we do wonderful. enjoy, though is our, our letter from the future. And Yay. Uh, yes, as you know, every week my great-great-granddaughter from the year 2300 sends me a letter from the future. There's a flash of photons next to my bed, and, and here's this week's letter. Dear GGG, it seemed like it took forever to get here, but now December 22nd and our marriage is racing towards us at warp speed. Michael and I couldn't be happier it feels like it did when we first started dating. Part of the reason for that is Michael is just about back to his old brilliant self again. He still has periods of frustration, whole mornings when he's furious at himself because he can't immediately solve a problem that was once simple for him, but he keeps at it and eventually he does solve it. In fact, this, week's, this week drilling with his redesigned drill is gonna start up again. I've already told you about his new drill design, how the individual sections of the drill can position themselves to maintain a straight line. Well, Michael has designed a system where the drill sections use neutrino emissions from quasars to position themselves. They'd be able to maintain a straight line even if the Earth disappeared. They get their energy from the heat of the surrounding rocks. It's an incredible system which, theoretically, could drill all the way to the crust, through the crust of the Earth. I'm so proud of him. Our research is going well, too. We've finally been able to construct computer models of sync life that act somewhat like the real thing. Now we can start to make test, make and test predictions about it. Gotta go, GGG. Love, Marie I. So there's our uh, letter from the future. And so we have a, a few minutes left. We have time for a call if someone would like to call in at 866-240-1065. And I just wanted to remind people that if you want to comment on the show, you could send a, a letter to uh, joe at joedemarforagreenfuture.org. That's J-O-E-D-E-M-A-R-E-F-O-R, agreenfuture.org. Uh, or you could send an actual physical letter. Some people still do that to P.O. Box 969, Bowling Green, Ohio, 43402. So uh, there's a couple ways to get hold of us. <sighs> well, all right, Rebecca, here we are with just a couple minutes left. Uh, I don't know if you heard at the start, but this was our 99th episode. So wow. Next week, yeah, next week is our 100th episode, and still trying to figure out what to do for that. Uh, if anybody has a suggestion, there's time for a call, 866-240-1065. But 
The other so, thing that I wanted you- to say about the pilgrims, if we have a minute, oh. is that um, the reason that they became sort of why this one little sort of group and this one incident got enshrined in our national mythology and has been embroidered on so much is because on the eve of the Civil War, there was a big argument about who really represented America, them or the, the slave-holding settlements in uh, North South Carolina or where, wherever it was. was the, who was the other bunch? Sir Walter Raleigh and them? Uh-huh. The, yeah. Yeah, so the, the whole enshrining of the pilgrims and declaring the, the festival of Thanksgiving to be a national holiday, there was a political purpose to that because uh, I guess, the whole massacre of the natives was considered to be more wholesome than slavery. <laughs> so comparatively, they came off looking good, I guess. Huh. Yeah, the uh, was it the yeah the Virginia colony the the uh, oh yeah, Virginia that was, yeah that's what I was thinking. Right, that that was considered. Yeah, it, well, as we say, Lincoln is the one who declared the national day of Thanksgiving, and so uh, he was making yeah, a point so it, there. <laughs> Yeah, but it, it's a deception. But again, like we said last week, it's a it's a beautiful deception that that image of us cooperatively sharing what we have with with the Native Americans and mutual respect. You know, that's that's a fiction we need to make into a reality. Blake right. Blake said that all lies are prophetic. I'm not sure I <laughs> believe him, but it, in this case, it would be nice if it were true. <laughs> so okay, yeah, well, well, I think we. We've reached the end of the show. Uh, thanks so much, Rebecca, for helping. And uh, thank you all yeah, for listening. It's, it's been a pleasure. This is Joe Damar. And Rebecca Wood. And we are signing off. I like birds and things. I